lot about all these other capabilities that mobile can do. It's going into the car, it's going into all these places, and I definitely want to talk about that. But let's talk about the core smartphone. I did a piece a while ago saying, you know, can smartphones break out of their rut? And obviously they're gaining new capabilities, but a lot of that is happening external to the phone. It's things your phone can do. Is the phone itself gonna change shape and get more powerful? Or have we kind of seen, you know, it's gonna get faster, better camera, but it's basically the smartphone of today is the same as two years ago and it's gonna look pretty much the same. Well, it's interesting, you know, uh, my perspective on that is probably a little different. Of course, we see, we see the, um, the industry from the perspective of somebody who provides a lot of, uh, of, the, of the core technology. And I'd say what's interesting is I think the rate at which features are changing in the underlying technology is actually increased versus decreased. And so you see a lot of demand for advanced modem features, things like the camera, video, things that are related to really consumption and generation of you know, content. We get a lot of demand or requests for uh, in increased innovation on the chipset side. In fact, if you look at the speed at which we are putting new chipsets out, it's actually increased, actually. And then there, we always get asked about, you know, is the smartphone over? It's really interesting. But um, at the end of the day, there are probably, uh, we think, about 8 billion new smartphones that will be launched worldwide in the next five years. And, you know, there are only seven, a little bit more than 7 billion people on the earth, which is interesting. You know, that's, that's a pretty interesting market, I think, for anybody. And then in addition, for a lot of those smartphones, the smartphones that uh, are in the developed world, I think they're going to be interfacing with a lot of other devices, kind of consistent with your question, where you have um, the device itself is in a sea of other devices. And those devices, um, you know, there could be multiple devices for every phone shipped. So I think there's still a lot of room left in the industry to provide innovation. And we saw some of that obviously yesterday in Cupertino, I was there for the Apple launch in terms of, you know, the iPhone itself gets a little thinner, better camera, faster, but you know, the big, the big change is it's suddenly now your wallet. What are some of the things, you know, the smartphone has a really rich history of basically replacing other devices, obviating the need for something that I carry. Uh, you know, it's got the potential in the next couple of years to replace keys, wallets, uh, talk about those markets and also other things it might replace. Well, I think if you look, if you look at where um, developer attention is being played, it's really the first wave was it, was, it was really get me an ecosystem of apps that work on a particular ecosystem, you know, related to the phone. Now you're seeing the ecosystem saying, hey, I want to also branch out beyond that. I want to figure out a way to extend my developer reach to my wrist, let's say, or to the car, or to the healthcare data. And I think that will be a pretty interesting um, set of experiences that people will, will tend to have. So if I, if, you know, we've always thought that the phone is probably more important to take with you than your wallet, just for, for uh, a lot of things. And, and I think people even get more stressed if they lose their uh, phone in many respects, uh, because they have so much of their life is involved uh, in that phone. But in the future, I think it's going to be more of a hub also for your medical data. And you started to see that a little bit in some of the announcements that we're seeing. Uh, and I think that will be a very, very interesting time as well. And there's two elements. I think a lot of people don't realize there's two elements to sort of health and, and mobile. There's sort of the wellness and fitness, and that moves at one pace. And then there's sort of health and disease management, which is more regulated. Um, talk about how those markets are different and, and sort of the pace of innovation we can expect to see. My guess is we'll see a lot more step trackers in the next year or two, and then a lot of really cool health things maybe a little bit beyond. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there, there's people putting, uh, kind of metering themselves up, and they're getting, their, they're getting data, and they're using that data to really manage their life and their wellness sort of on their own. I think that's one level, it's interesting, and I think there's a lot of, uh, of, of interesting products that come out from that. But in addition, I think the real breakthrough is when you meter up the entire population, uh, and there's a lot of non-technical things that have to be solved in order for that to happen, but if you could imagine the world where you had the uh, respiration, heart rate, you had the blood pressure, oxygen level of, uh, of basically everyone, the, the speed at which we would learn and improve the healthcare really of the, of the entire world would accelerate dramatically. And I think that, that is uh, a situation where I think you're probably holding back um, you know, the ocean with a broom. Eventually, that will happen. So the data and privacy concerns are there, but 
just inevitable hurdles to be overcome? I think those are things that people will figure out how to solve. I think on the other side of that is such an, an interesting uh, advancement in terms of how we can actually improve people's lives and the health of people uh, that I think it's pretty difficult to think that that's not going to be the case. I mean, if you look today in healthcare, uh, essentially they use the same tools that have been used for you know, almost a century in many, in many respects in terms of daily measurement of people's health. And uh, I don't think that's going to be consistent with what's going to happen moving forward. So those things will be solved. There's a lot of work to be done to solve those things. Um, but I think it will happen, and I think it'll be pretty interesting. And you guys have some fascinating stuff in the labs. I remember I was down in San Diego uh, visiting you guys once, and they were talking about sensors that can basically predict when you're going to have a heart attack. And right. one of the big issues they were looking at is, how do you tell the person they're about to have a heart attack without giving them the heart attack they're about to have? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's probably outside of our area of expertise, actually, <laughs> in many respects. But um, I think you see uh, what's interesting. There's, there's kind of two, two uh, I would say, areas of innovation that we see. One is on the sensor side. There's just a tremendous amount of work being done on making low-cost sensors that can be extensions of your smartphone or wearable device or what have you. Uh, that's one. The other one is from the chipset side, from the core technology that goes into the phone, there's a whole uh, basket of features where people are asking us to put together really purpose-built engines to service these type of devices. So, so things when you're constantly monitoring pulse rate or you're constantly monitoring uh, gyros and things like that, uh, it's a different type of design that you use to do that versus what you would use to the C do the CPU or the GPU to run the modem or, or the main screen. And so you're starting to see that if you look at the core technologies, you'll see these purpose-built built engines and um, still a lot, of, a lot of innovation left to do that. The camera, having the camera on all the time and monitoring things, uh, that's another level of, uh, of innovation people are asking us to push. Interesting implications for battery life. Is there any, that's probably, you know, the single biggest concern. I'm sure most of the audience is at, you yeah. know, 35% since it's about 10 a.m. Uh, any, any breakthroughs on the horizon, or where is the best area of improvement short of a big breakthrough? Well, I think the, the core chemistry in the, in the battery is obviously improving, but not improving at the same rate at which we want to have more, more energy into the device or energy capability in the device. We've worked a lot on trying to figure out easy ways to charge the device. So things like wireless charging, even, for example, in a car, uh, having the car charge the phone, trickle charge the phone while you're in it. I think is going to be an interesting part of what's going on. But there's going to always be a gap between what people want to do, what we can produce with Moore's Law, and, and the energy that's available in the phone. And that's where the, the, the um, design points of mobile really deviate from what you would see, let's say, in a data center or in a, car, or in a PC. It's really a very, very different design point. And, um, that's what we've been spending most of our time working on. Sure. Before we talk about some of those other areas, cars and, and wearables and so forth, let's talk one more area of the phone that I know is really important to you guys and, and to a lot of the folks in the audience. In terms of you know, LTE, you know, a lot of people, you know, it was this on-off thing. You had LTE, you didn't. Um, and for you guys, it was a great position to be in because in a lot of cases, as a chip supplier, you had integrated chips that had LTE and the competition didn't. Now, we're getting into a much more nuanced world. There's a whole bunch of flavors of LTE beyond sort of that first step. Uh, LTE Advanced, which is itself a basket of things, LTE and unlicensed spectrum. Which are the, of these new technologies are going to be really important, and what are the tangible benefits? Well, we're on our fourth generation of LTE products, and all of our LTE products actually include both the TD mode and the FDD mode, so worldwide coverage. Uh, but what we're being pushed to do, in addition to just, I would call it speeds and feeds, so much faster data rate, is the ability to um, have the device work in a very complicated spectrum uh, environment. So a, a number of the, of the people who, um, who I'm sure in the audience are actually trying to figure out how can they get more capacity, but they need to get more capacity given a very, very complicated spectrum allocation. And uh, so what we tend to do on the device is have a means by which we can aggregate that spectrum. So you see things like carrier aggregation being very, very important. But then when you map out and you try to figure out what would happen worldwide, it becomes incredibly complicated. And we spend a lot of time on that. But then in addition, we think it's important not only to use the licensed band, but also the unlicensed band to try to solve this big uh, capacity issue that we have uh, as an industry. And the reason why we see that capacity in this, uh, issue is there's a big demand between, or gap between 
how much data we can provide and the cost at which we can provide that data to the consumer and what the developer really wants to have access to. And we think we'd call that the thousand X challenge, but um, that is uh, a real big issue that we've been spending time on and it's become a very complicated um, radio situation for the device. And we saw some of that um, play out. You know, there were a couple nuances, again, of Apple's iPhone 6 yesterday. One, it supports uh, sprints 2.5 gigahertz. It supports a bunch of new types of spectrum that weren't in previous devices. And then also, as you mentioned, this support for carrier aggregation. How common are sort of, and when do these next generation LTE technologies, when are we going to see them be mainstream? Well, I think uh, in, in many respects, um, those devices are, are similar. Carrier aggregation has been launched worldwide, even upstream of the announcements you had, you saw yesterday. So we're seeing uh, a tremendous momentum uh, for that. We just announced a chipset last night or yesterday afternoon that um, brings carrier aggregation down to our lowest end chipset, and uh, we think that that will be important not only here in the United States but uh, worldwide, in particular in China. Eventually, uh, carrier aggregation will be important there as well. So. Um, we think it's going to be an interesting time, and I'll tell you, the one thing that I, that I, uh, I see when I see the, the modem feature sets is that you tend to see the high-end modem features coupled with high-end Wi-Fi features. And that's the other, the other element, I think, of announcements that, that we see, is the, the importance of um, offloading things in the proper way that's friendly with in terms of how... Uh, how the services are maintain continuity, and it's a very complicated problem, but it's driving um, a lot of momentum and really velocity in the features that we provide on the modem. The other thing I've really noticed is the speed at which things that were high end get to the mid tier and even the low end of the market. It yeah. seems like there's you know increasingly that low end smartphone is really really capable. It's the you know Galaxy or iPhone of a couple of years ago in terms of power. Um, you know, uh, Motorola, I was talking to them uh, last week at their event, and uh, their president, Rick Osterloh, said, you know, the days of the $600 or $700 smartphone are numbered. You know, is the pace of innovation happening so fast that we're, there's going to be a large high end? Or do you see sort of the smartphone, you know, a bigger opportunity in the low and mid end? For us, we actually do both. If you look at the high end, still a lot of feature uh, innovation, then we try to trickle that down to the low end very rapidly. Worldwide, um, a lot of the growth in the smartphone industry is, is occurring really in places that have low or almost none, uh, no um, smartphone or 3G, 4G penetration. And so the first time that people get on the internet is, when, is, a, is as a phone. And uh, the only way that you can bring that cost point to them is to really, really focus on bringing those feature sets down um, in an integrated way. And so we've been focused on that, and what we believe is that the, uh, the number, even though the, the technology is moving very rapidly down, the increase in the number of units more than offsets that in terms of the business. And I want to talk, um, and you mentioned you know, some of these areas where the, basically the same brains and guts of a smartphone are being used you know, in very similar ways in other devices. One of those is the car. How important is the car? How different is the car from the business you guys have been in historically? Well, I think one of, the, one of the interesting things about where the smartphone industry now is, if you just have to remember what the size of it is. I mean, they're essentially a billion units a year, a little bit more than a billion units a year. We shipped about 750 million just last year. And uh, you contrast that with the car industry. Cars worldwide, about, a, about 100 million a year. PCs, somewhere in the 300s. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of scale in the smartphone industry. And what we're being asked to do is, can you figure out how to bring that technology into adjacent markets? And the car, you know, a lot of discussion in the, in the previous panel, but basically the car is pulling new smartphone technology into it very rapidly, even more rapidly than we're seeing it go into the, into the home, believe it or not. But at the same time, there is a real difference in that they design cars several years out and they're on the road for 10 or 15 years versus two years right. for a smartphone. How much of an adjustment is that for all of the mobile industry that's sort of moving into the car? Well, I think there's, a, there's a, obviously a different supply chain. The speed at which the supply chain moves is, is uh, at a different pace. The car, the car companies are moving very rapidly to do that and embracing some of the, some of the um, technologies and some of the, the working models like software upgrades and things like that. Um, that are more consistent with what we would see in a, in a, in a uh, consumer electronics driven market, for example. And uh, so I, I, I think that's increasing pretty rapidly. If you look at the speed 
at which 3G went into the car from its first launch and the speed at which 4G went into the car in its first launch. The, the gap in time is, is pretty significant. Another area, obviously, that mobile is going heavily into are wearable devices. Um, I noticed you're wearing uh, one of the smartwatches. Uh, this is the Moto 360 that got launched last week. Apple obviously previewed its Apple Watch. What are some of the things that you think the wearable needs to do to become a mainstream? I mean, it seems like it doesn't yet do enough yeah. uh, that everyone wants to give it a place on their wrist. I think you're, you're in a spot where, um, and this happens in the industry at certain times, you're in a spot where uh, there's a tremendous amount of experimentation. And uh, what we try to do is try to make it easy for people to experiment. So they basically experiment. They experiment with what brand they need. They experiment with, with form factor. You always get an improvement in some sort of technology that, that helps them either on the screen side or the battery side, material improvements, uh, what have you. Uh, and I think we're in that mode right now with wearables. Everyone kind of has this gut feel that there's something there, and then they'll experiment. And all of a sudden, someone will figure it out and everyone will race to do something similar, and then the, the cycle will start over again. Do you think Apple figured it out? Well, I think, I think everybody's got uh, pretty interesting looking products. I haven't seen the product, but it looks very, very good. Um, we, we're obviously believers in the wearable, um, the wearable craze. I think you're gonna also see um, the phone interacting not just with things on your wrist, but I think the whole idea of, of looking through something and having your apps actually see are, is an important thing as well. We've come out with technology which, is, which we call Vuforia, which essentially allows the application to um, you know, basically put things into the viewfinder so that it can actually see and the developer can take advantage of what your camera is seeing in addition to just in real time, for example. So some of that is augmented reality kind of fun and games, but I, what I hear you saying is there's something beyond fun and games? That's right. Advertisers think that's an interesting way of, of uh, either teaching people about their product or it can enhance their brand, for example. You'll see that in um, McDonald's actually did this through the, um, the, the French World fries. Cup. Yeah, that was actually using our technology. And so I think you're going to see people experiment with these technologies, and then when they figure out the business model, it tends to go. A uh, similar thing that you would see even with the wallet or healthcare. People are going to try, they're going to make mistakes, they're going to keep, keep at it, and I think it will, uh, it will work. It'll work out. And that's the way almost every uh, major in, uh, enhancement or improvement in the industry happens is that people have to take some risk and then they figure it out over time. And what we tend to do is try to be behind them, providing the scale and the technology to make that easy. Now with watches, you guys actually did a little bit more. You got, went out and put out essentially a watch for sale that talked that had your Mirasol display and some other Qualcomm technologies. What did you guys learn from that? And I assume the business model isn't to get into the watch game That's long correct. term. That's correct. Yeah, we, we have in the course of the company's history uh, occasionally done end products, primarily for two reasons. One is to learn about what we don't know about the product. You really, we're a systems company by and large, and the only way to learn about the system is to actually build it. So when there's a new, new device category, we tend to build it all the way down to the end device, figure out what we don't know about it, and then really work with our partners. And that's what you're seeing with the talk uh, situation. Uh, but no, we're not, we're, not, uh, we're not in the watch business. Does Mirasol seem to be getting, Mirasol, for those of you who don't know, it's this technology that has some of the benefits of e-ink in terms of long battery life, um, but it's color, it can even display a little bit of video. Is that getting a foothold? Uh, Timex, I think, is using it. Um, is there, are there others? Are we going to see others? You see Timex is using it. Um, and the real benefit of it is the ability to, um, it, it works, it's very, very bright outdoors because, it, because of the way in which the physics work on it. And, um, and so it's interesting to see, it'll be interesting to see how people use that, let's say, for sports or for fitness-related activities. And um, again, it's a, it's a situation where you have technology you provide it to people, and then they can tend to figure out how to use it the best way. And sometimes to learn how to do that, you have to build a little bit more of the end device. Are more people? Are you going to be providing it to more people than, than them? We're very happy to provide it to anybody that, uh, that wants to come get it. OK, he's available afterwards <laughs> if you want to buy some Mirasol displays. Uh, another uh, a favorite topic of yours, I know, is China. I know there's not a lot you can say about um, you know, the antitrust investigation going on, but what does it mean that some of the customers there have essentially, if I understood your earnings release right, they've stopped paying their bills ahead of the, uh, ahead of the uh, investigation. What is, what is the China situation for you guys? Well, I mean, it, it is difficult for us to talk about it. We're in the middle of, middle of an investigation, obviously, but um, 
one of the trends that we're seeing in China, we've been in China obviously for a long time and have a lot of customers and, and close partners there. And uh, what's interesting, if I, if I look at sort of the, the worldwide smartphone market, you are seeing the emergence of, I would say, the Chinese premium handset exporter. So you're seeing companies like uh, Oppo and BBK and, and uh, Xiaomi looking to say, hey, how do I build on my strength in China? How do I come to the United States? How do I come to Europe, Latin America, and Southeast Asia? And um, we think that's a natural place for us to partner with them. And we've had strength in, in China. Uh, we obviously have some, some issues now in terms of, of, of working through the investigation, but we'll get through that. And, uh, and then we'll figure out uh, how to work on the next innovation together. What are the areas that you think Qualcomm needs to invest more in? What are the areas, what's on your to-do list, your priorities? Well, I think the, the, there's still a lot of room left on the phone from innovation, working into adjacent markets. How do we make healthcare easy to, to do in mobile? How do we get the car and the home and the tablet market to really leverage the strength of, mar of, of, um, of mobile? It's very, very important. But even beyond that, there are a number of technologies which we think are going to be interesting down the road as more and more of the internet and more and more of the cloud is interested in what happens at the edge, not just what happens on your phone, but what happens on your wrist, what you're seeing, how, you know, when the car is driving around and it's connected, it's going to be consuming a lot of information. And that information is going to be sent back either to the cloud or processed remotely. So there's going to be a real need for things like very, very low power, high, high performance computing. So you can take bits and pieces of what the cloud infrastructure exists in the cloud and move it to the edge. And you can do things like remote caching. You can actually process things out there. And if you look at what will happen when you have billions of devices connected to the internet in a place like this, um, you really have to, you have to construct the internet in a different way. Where the data lives, where the, what the infrastructure looks like will be, will be very interesting. The other aspect, I think computer vision and things like machine learning and tailoring that for mobile instead of just back in the cloud, uh, I think are pretty interesting uh, technologies for us to be working on. So it seems to me that there's still a lot of innovation left in the, in the communication space um, for our industry. Cool, well it sounds like if we sit down a year from now we'll have a lot more to talk about. Absolutely. Great, thanks Steve. Thank you. Thank you.